Hey, what's up everybody? Today, we're gonna talk about menopause and understand what is actually happening to your body. You're watching Modern Aging, where we chat about innovative and holistic ways to elevate our health and well-being as we age. I want you to make sure that you click on that subscribe button below and that little bell next to it to be sure you'll be notified whenever a new episode is uploaded. Today's guest is Dr. Rachel Van Pelt. She's a healthspan scientist and a healthspan coach. She helps women take back their body energy and strength in midlife and beyond. Welcome, Rachel. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Risa. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited for this talk because I feel like I actually went to a workshop on menopause and I learned so much and I'm like, how do I not know all this stuff? It's crazy. Um, It's not something that we learn in school, of course, and I feel like there's a lot of kind of taboo around it still. Um, So why don't we just kind of go to the beginning and if you can just tell me and tell the audience like what is so what's perimenopause versus menopause sure yeah so uh you know you're not considered postmenopausal until you haven't had any cycles for at least 12 months so of course we don't know we're postmenopausal until we look retrospectively and and haven't had any cycles for 12 months and that can for a lot of women we start our cycles start to change. We, you know, we start skipping cycles. Maybe sometimes they get heavier or longer or lighter, whatever. There's a lot of changes that occur and that's perimenopause. Those, those years of, you know, it's starting to change, but we haven't, it hasn't gone, we haven't gone 12 months without a cycle yet. And the average age for most women is around the age of 52, give or take a few years. But of course, if, you know, there's a lot of women who go through earlier surgical, have surgical or chemically induced menopause. And so it can start earlier. Um, if you have a hysterectomy and your ovaries are left intact, you can still keep producing hormones and, uh, and still have all of the menopausal, you start having symptoms around the time those cycles start to change. And that's, and so the perimenopausal years is really that transition through, you know, where those cycles start getting really irregular, the hormones are going all over the place. It's a, it's a fun time for all. <laughs> so um, hot flashes, do they, can, can they happen in perimenopause or they're kind of full on menopausal symptom? Yeah, I know that like a lot of those symptoms of hot flashes and night sweats and all of those fun things, the moodiness, libido changes, all of that can start happening even before we stopped cycling completely. So yeah, perimenopausal years are just as fun as postmenopause. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there, are there certain things that are hereditary? Cause my mom really didn't have severe, you know, night sweats or hot flashes or anything like that. Do you, I mean, can you look to your mother and say, oh, I guess this is what'll happen to me type of thing? Yeah, there's a little bit of evidence that there's some hereditariness though. It, you know, it can, you know, when we look at twins, uh, you know, who are genetically identical, they can have very different experiences of menopause. So the genetic component, the hereditary, Terry, you know, family history isn't super predictive of how you go, but, um, but it, it does have some impact. Yeah. So what is actually happening to the body when we enter, you know, perimenopause or menopausal phase of life? Yeah. Well, a lot of things are happening. Uh, you know, the, the the biggest thing is the hormonal changes. So, you know, our ovaries stop producing estrogen and progesterone. And as those, those come down that they regulate so many other hormones. So they regulate like our thyroid hormones and our, you know, our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And there's a lot of, a lot of other downstream effects that aren't really necessarily the cause, you know, menopause aren't necessarily menopause, um, directly associated, but they happen because the estrogen, estrogen and progesterone go down at menopause. And so, and then, you know, and so the hormonal changes are happening. Then of course, there's a lot of changes then that, 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 that has downstream on a lot of our physical health, our cardiovascular function. You know, we have changes in our, in our vasculature, we have changes in our muscle quality, our bone quality, uh, our metabolism, 
you know, brain function. That's, you know, a lot of the symptoms that women have, you know, revolve around kind of mood swings and irritability and, and anxiety and depression and all that again, you know, occur kind of as a result of the loss of those sex hormones at the time of menopause. Wow. That's crazy. So, I mean, I'm, of course, each woman is individual and, you know, women will have it, um, to varying degrees. Um, are there certain things that we can do, um, to prevent some of these, you know, awful symptoms that some women really have a hard time with? Because I, my mother-in-law had hot flashes for really, I mean, for years. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like some women really do, and they have them pretty bad where, you know, all of a sudden they'll be at work and then they're like dripping in sweat. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even realize it could be that severe. Yeah, those, those, uh, we call them vasomotor symptoms and the, yeah, the hot flashes, the night sweats, those, the, the, the fluctuations that occur, uh, can be pretty traumatic for women, you know, can trigger headaches and, you know, obviously mood swings and all that. Um, you know, one of the number one things for mitigating that is giving back estrogen. And so hormone replacement therapy, and I know a lot of people are fearful of that for various reasons, and, the, and, and it's changed over time whether we should, you know, all women should be on hormones and nobody should be on hormones. And it's kind of come back full center to realize that there's a, a, there's a great place for giving back, you know, replacing the, hor the estrogen that's, that's lost. And um, it's not an option for everybody. And, and some people then need to use natural solutions. There are, you know, phytoestrogens you can uh, try to try to um, replace those naturally but to be honest most you know uh, things like soy or sweet potatoes there's a lot of that kind of stuff where there's there's a there's high amount of phytoestrogens or plant-based estrogens um, they really don't do the same thing as 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 a, a you know taking estradiol for example but um, but then you know getting on top of lifestyle habits is is probably the easiest and natural way. It won't get rid of those symptoms completely, but will help mitigate them. So, you know, physical activity, nutrition, sleep, self-care, all of those things, when those are dialed in for folks, that it really lessens the, the number of hot flashes and night sweats and, um, you know, and, and the severity of them. Wow. So is this something that women should be thinking about in their 30s type of thing that they should be di started to dial in like earlier? Or is it the type of thing where, you know, you're in your late 40s or you're in your 50s and you start to feel like, you know, your cycles start to become irregular or something. You start to get certain signs and say, okay, is it too late? Or is it, you know, you can still go in and be like, okay, I'm going to start exercising a little bit more regularly, um, eat more fruits and vegetables, whole foods, get off the processed foods. Um, I guess, yeah. is it ever too late? No, it's never too late. And, uh, you know, I do think, of course, the sooner you start, the better for a lot of things. Um, and if nothing else, just because it, it becomes more habit, more ingrained and easier to sustain when we start going through the menopause transition. And we have all these, you know, it's a t also a time, midlife is a time, you know, when we have lots of things going on, we got a lot of career stress or, you know, or, or family responsibilities, you know, there's lots of distractions, right? And so, and then when you add on the hormonal changes, it gets hard and things go out the window. So that is a benefit of starting early and building habits that you can sustain through menopause when times are tough, but you can, you know, you know, you start feeling those symptoms. That's actually a time to double down on our health because that's when, things are, are, we're right at that precipice, that pivot point where we're, where things are starting to drop off pretty dramatically. And when the estrogen and progesterone drop off, that's also when we start losing muscle pretty quickly, bone, we start gaining fat quickly and, you know, memory declines, all of that stuff. So if nothing else, it's a red flag for, oh, hey, I better, I better, I better kick in and, and, and do more work. It's not a time to say, oh, I'm just going to muddle through it. And once I'm done with this menopause thing, I'll deal with my health then because 
menopause, especially like the perimenopausal years and, and the symptoms and everything can last, you know, for sometimes a decade for women. So it's a, you don't want to just wait and ride it out. It's any time that you, you know, you can get started. That's uh, the time to start. Wow. So you can be perimenopausal for a decade? Well, yeah. I mean, you can be having symptoms of menopause for, so that transition can start pretty young, even at, you know, even though you don't stop your cycles until maybe age 52, let's say, you can start having symptoms in your late forties and all the way, you know, through to your, you know, mid fifties, late fifties. So it's a, it's a pretty long transition period and a lot's going on and a lot of, it's a really great time to get on top of your health because, um, you can you can really reverse a lot of those age related declines that happen around the time of menopause. So then, what is so? When are you then menopausal, and then when are you, and then postmenopausal is after twelve months you had mentioned. So what's the right. menopause phase? Uh, so, I mean, perimenopause is, it really is just peri or post, post, you know? So yeah, I mean, we say menopausal kind of loosely and that could, that could be peri or post, but it's, it's all, yeah, it's, it's really either, either you're done or you're not. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a lot of women talk about how difficult it is to lose weight during this time, that they start to gain the belly fats they can't get rid of, they're trying everything, they've tried every single diet and nothing is working. Like, why is that happening and what can women do if they want to get rid of the belly fat? Yeah, that's 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 a, a key question that I get all the time and, and for sure that our estrogen is... Uh, an important hormone for determining where we store our fat. That's why women store their fat, tend to store their fat in their hips and thighs compared to their belly prior to menopause and, you know, and, and uh, compared to men who tend to store it all abdominally. Well, after menopause, when we lose that estrogen, we start to gain that more of that, that fat in our belly rather than our hips and our thighs. And it's really interesting because not all fat is created equal, that that belly fat is is more harmful to our health than actually the hip and thigh fat. Uh, a lot of the research that I did actually was beneficial to our health, that storing our fat down there was a good place for our, our, our body to store the fat and away from the our organs and things in our in our belly. But but to answer your question, the to to slow that fat gain uh, that happens around the time of menopause, you know, a, a, a good first step is if you if estrogens in, you know, is available to you, if you're not one of those people that can't take estrogen replacement, and and you've got symptoms and things, estrogen when you when you're on estrogen will actually slow and, and prevent some of that abdominal fat accumulation. Uh, but if that's not an option for you, the best next thing is exercise and nutrition. Exercise helps to reduce the amount of abdominal fat gain. And it's actually the easiest way and probably even better than just taking estrogen. Estrogen will slow the that, but, but exercise will help you to lose fat in the abdominal region. So exercise and particularly higher intensity exercise and, um, and then, uh, you know, it, uh, leveling up our nutrition and the amount of nutrient dense foods that we get into our body at that time. Yeah, I feel like um, some women think, you know, they can kind of continue to eat how they eat and exercise or vice versa and still lose weight. But, um, but you were mentioning how uh, before the call, how weight loss, how we are actually even thinking about weight loss in the wrong way as we age um, because we're also losing muscle mass naturally uh, and things are just, because of what's naturally happening due to aging in our body, we kind of really need to rethink the, about the way um, we want to lose that weight. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's way too much focus on weight loss, you know, so we, that's the first thing that happens. We start, you know, we go, we're going through menopause, you know, we start to, we start to lose muscle, we start to gain fat and our, and our immediate response is, well, 
to, you know, to diet, to go on a diet, to try to lose weight. And, you know, but one of the big precipitating factors is the fact that we're losing muscle and our, so, and when we lose muscle, our muscle is what burns all the calories. And when we lose muscle, so our basal metabolic rate goes down, which accounts for 70% of how many calories burn in any given day. So when we then go on a diet and lose weight, we restrict our calories, you know, we're counting calories, we're counting carbs, whatever, we're eating fewer calories. Now, we we lose some we may lose a little bit of weight but we are also losing muscle our metabolism goes down further and now we set ourselves up for if we go back to eating you know our usual amount of food then now we're at the lower metabolism now we're setting ourselves up to actually gain more fat and we don't usually gain the muscle back and so it becomes this downward vicious cycle where we're we keep trying we're chasing you know something that we can't ever attain because we're we, with each with each time we we lose weight and we regain you know our muscles going down our metabolism's going down exacerbated by the estrogen the loss of estrogen now we're now we're in a vicious cycle where we can't we can't win we can't we're just going to keep gaining abdominal fat and losing muscle and eating fewer and fewer calories so now now instead of a 2000 calorie diet we're eating 1500 calorie diet and um and it's harder than now to stay nourished and now we're getting we're we're at risk of malnourishment and and so then our energy is low we don't have energy to exercise and it's just this round robin of problems and so it's really critical um, at the time of menopause that we have to double down on keeping our muscle mass up and keeping our nourishment up, keeping our energy balance high. Uh, and then we can worry about weight loss um, down the road in a safe way that isn't, isn't going to lead to weight regain. Wow. So that's so when you talk about you know, high intensity exercise, are you talking about weight training? You're talking about, you know, do you focus on your abs type of thing, like all the core stuff? Or is it, you know, running will also kind of, um, is cardio just as important or? Yeah, the short answer is we need a little bit of of everything. We do need cardiovascular, um, fitness and, and, you know, that's where we're going to, we're going to burn the calories and keep our cardiovascular system, our heart pumping, our lungs and everything. But, um, the, the muscular fitness, you know, strength training, that is absolutely critical for maintaining our muscle mass, because if you're just running or biking or, you know, doing cardiovascular exercise, walking and so forth, you're still going to lose some muscle. Um, and so it's absolutely critical that we do a little bit of, the, you know, because we need to keep our musculoskeletal strength up, but we also need to car- keep our cardiovascular fitness up. And unfortunately, we can't spot lose, <laughs> you know, doing more abdominal or core exercises, things like that won't help us lose that belly fat that's more that's has more to do with the loss of estrogen that's happening at menopause and 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 you know declines in physical activity and and adverse changes in our nutrition that are contributing to that that gain right there in the abdominal region yeah wow so i guess the key is to start early and create that healthy lifestyles um for yourself so that I guess maybe the so maybe that you know menopause I don't know would menopause I guess the the symptoms would be lessened a little bit if if like you say you know you have a, a nutrient dense diet and you have constant exercise and um, and you mentioned sleep um, I think that sleep is really underestimated um, and it's also really hard for people to have restful sleep I mean how do I've been super lucky that I, I can sleep anywhere. (laughs) Um, And I've never had that issue. But I know plenty of people who do. Um, Are there recommendations that you have for people who have problems sleeping? Yeah, sleep is a big one. It's a that one is disrupted pretty acutely as we go through menopause, you know, primarily because a night sweat night sweats are a big one that wake women up. But also just the quality of our sleep goes down. Even if we're not waking up drenched in sweat, we the quality of our sleep gets impaired 
it's also exacerbated by stress, you know, so the, the loss of estrogen is also responsible for our increases in our anxiety and depression, you know, mood changes. And so if you already have some underlying anxiety and depression, things that are keeping you awake at night, you're waking up at 3 a.m. and can't fall back to sleep because your mind's racing, it only gets worse as we go through menopause. Um, and it is hard to get on top of, you know, the biggest thing that, you know, and, and, and unfortunately, a lot of times uh, we then what women what happens is women get um, prescribed anti anxiety meds, antidepressants, sleep meds, like, you know, they just get thrown a lot of medications and those don't, they'll help you sleep more hours, but not necessarily improve your quality of sleep. And so we wake up groggy you know, that, uh, you know, that now we, we have low energy during the day. Now we're, you know, reaching for comfort foods and caffeine and everything to kind of get us through the day that sets us up again for not very good sleep the next night. And it's, that also is a vicious cycle that is h hard to get on top of the best ways are really to try to do this, do it naturally with, you know, um, changes to our sleep hygiene, consistent, you know, a lot of those, the, the tried and true consistent bedtime, consistent wake time, you know, but there's also strategies that you can use to help you fall back asleep in the middle of the night or, you know, recognize that, that it's okay to lay, like not to get up out of bed and, and start, start working or something because you can't sleep that, you know, it is okay to at least lie in bed and be awake and you can still get some rest that way. So there's a lot of things that we can do to, to improve the quality of our sleep, uh, even going through menopause and beyond. Um, and it's absolutely critical. That's a big one for why also we have, we struggle with weight gain and muscle loss and all that because it's all integrated. And when our sleep quality diminishes, it, 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 makes it um, more likely that we're going to gain weight. It also changes our hunger and satiety signals. So we feel more hungry, less satiated when we eat things. We, we reach for more comfort foods and so forth. So it's, it's really important to get quality sleep if we want to stay on top of our health and, and slow those changes, those age-related changes that are occurring around the time of menopause. Wow, who knew that sleep would affect so many different areas, but you can see how it can become a quickly, a, you know, this snowball that just, um, the snowball effect. And so I didn't realize that you could, so your hunger and your cravings increase if you don't get proper sleep. That's yeah. crazy. Um, so when you're in menopause, is there, um, should you be getting more sleep? or less sleep? It doesn't matter. I mean, is there like, or is it the same number of hours? Yeah, really it's the quality of those hours. You know, on average people need around seven hours, give or take, you know, there's a very small fraction of the population that can actually get away with four hours. There's a special gene that, you know, that there's there, you know, so, but when so when people say, oh, I can survive on four hours of sleep a night and I'm fine not very many people can actually do that. We, we, most of us need a good seven hours, give or take, but you can have a really high quality six hours, or you can have a really cruddy quality eight hours of sleep. So the duration is less important than the quality of those hours, how deep, how much deep sleep you're getting, how much REM sleep. And that can be severely affected by, yeah, medications you're taking, late night eating, screen time. There's a lot of things that can actually disrupt our circadian rhythms and and our sleep patterns that um, that are that are easy to get on top of, um, but uh, but yeah, I improving that does take does take a concerted effort. So as we wrap this up, um, is there any good news around menopause? <laughs> is there anything that we can look forward to? Um. Yes. Yes. I think menopause is beautiful. So I think we're fed a lot. I think we are, I think society conditioned us to think like life is over at menopause. It's all downhill from here, you know, and I know even what I'm talking about age related declines and stuff like that gets kind of depressing, but the reality is we can empower ourselves. There's so much we can do to, to, to reverse those declines, prevent those declines, really maximize our health span, the quality of life that we have. And 
honestly, I think women are entering the prime of their life at menopause that that giving in to, you know, the, you know, our, the hormone decline. Yeah, there, there's some stuff that stinks around menopause, let's face it. And we're going to have to just, you know, we just have to some of it, we have to just deal with it and learn how to manage it. And we can do that. But honestly, you know, our, I think our spirit and the, you know, our life experience, and there's just so much that, that we're just beginning the prime of our life. And I've been working with postmenopausal women my entire career. And, you know, even as a 20 year old and 30 year old, and I was always so inspired by the wisdom and the, and the maturity and the, all the, and the grace and, and things that, that, that women, um, you know, we're just stepping into the prime, finally get to that point where they're, you know, you know, kids are, are growing up, they're moving on, you know, there's, and, and women are starting to put themselves first, really realizing that this is a time to, to flourish, that we don't have to give in to, you know, age related decline, that we can empower ourselves and really step powerfully and confidently into our best next act. And I, I, Definitely, that's, you know, my mission is just to remind people that that's, it's not, it's not all downhill from here, you know, we can actually feel better in our 50s, 60s and 70s than we did in our 30s and 40s. And we're smarter and wiser and our spirit is growing and, um, and we can mitigate those, those physical declines. That is awesome. Right on. I totally, I'm totally totally on point with you. Um, thank you so much, Rachel. This was so informative and insightful and enlightening. And um, so if people want to reach you, how do they reach you? How can they find you? Yeah, my website is rachelvanpelt.com or you can reach me on Facebook or Instagram at Dr. Rachel Van Pelt. 